In our next video, I'm gonna be making my own oil paints from scratch. But first, I wanted to make the brushes I'll need to paint with, and to learn a little background on the history of painting, so pay a visit to the Minneapolis Institute of Art for a little inspiration. To help give some context and suggestions, I talked with Robert Casolino, a curator of paintings at the MIA, and Rita Berg, a painting conservator at the Midwest Art Conservation Center. I want to make my own paint, and uh, you thought this painting would be an interesting example to look at? Yeah, Andy, this is a painting by Sylvia Fine, who is an artist who's still with us. She's going to turn 100 on November 20th. Sylvia Fine, when she was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, there was a guy there named James Watrous who wanted his artists, who are students, to experiment with historical techniques of the past. And Sylvia claims that when she made this painting in 1943, she was using a recipe called Alcarius Labeg, and it was a mixture of whale wax, gum mastic, ashes, lime, some kind of solution with lye in it, a whole range of different kinds of things. But I do know that Sylvia would go source pure powdered pigment from various places where you could still get that, mm -hmm. and either take their own linseed oil or poppy oil in some cases, and mix them with this and come up with their own individual kind of handcrafted paint mixtures so that what they were putting down would be as much an individual expression um, as the quality of their paint strokes. So unlike artists today, which have a variety of different paints and different colors available to them, early Italian Renaissance artists had a very limited palette. A traditionally, tempera paint only has three components. So it has your pigment, it has the egg yolk, which is the binder, and water, which is the dilutant. Those would be mixed together. And given the nature of the tempera, it dries very quickly. It spoils very quickly. So it had to be made over and over and over again. The medium only allowed you to apply the paint very thinly in little strokes, in little parallel strokes. So if you look very closely, you'll see that all of these figures, all of the flash tones, are painted in small, small, small brush strokes that run parallel to each other. And I try to make my own paint. Any recommendations? I would go with the simple recipe first of uh, trying egg tempera with distilled water, um, egg, and uh, powdered pigment and see what that gets you. My main focus is on eventually making my own oil paint. But following their advice, I thought I'd do a quick attempt at tempera before I move on. So first up, I'm gonna try and make some egg tempera, and that just uses some egg yolk and some pigments and some water. Collected some of the simplest pigments I could find, and I got some uh, ash from the charcoal grill. Black. And then dirt from just outside. Just need something that's black and brown to paint. Dobby. And I got these uh, little canvases, and I'm gonna send those to our $75 patrons, and you'll have a little piece of custom artwork from me. Tempera was popular for painting up until the 1500s when oil paints started to become more popular for a variety of reasons. So next, I want to make a few options of brushes to eventually apply all my paints with. Previously, in my series on making a book from scratch, I collected horsehair and made a primitive brush from it. However, recently I've collected a soft metal, tin, but I thought I might be able to make a few more brushes in a more modern style, using a metal ferrule to hold the hairs in. <laughs> but first, I need to make a piece of sheet metal out of some tin ingots. Working? 
I think so. We're working the tin. It needs to be annealed by heating it to just below melting. Otherwise, it'll start to crack. It's hard to tell exactly when tin is at its annealing temp since it has such a low melting point. Awesome. But a way to tell is by rubbing some soap on it and then heating it until the soap starts to turn black. Once I hammered it thin enough, I can run through a metal mill to slowly flatten it out even further. Ooh, now it's like buttery. Then take the hairs, cut and align all of them, and insert them into the ferrule, and then pinching all the edges to make it tight. Lastly, dipping them into some cornstarch to help them hold their shape. How is that? Sure. Now with the completed brushes, I just need to mix my pigments and oil to make the paint and start painting. But first, I paid a visit to Rita's workshop to learn a little more about her job as a painting conservator. Do you consider your job more of a science or an art or just a blend? Oh, from day to day, I wouldn't say art. I'm, I may be creative mixing some um, colors, but I'm really keeping to the artist intent. There's a place for science as well, for scientific analysis, for understanding how uh, pigments change over time, how different materials change over time. We do a lot of testing. So when a painting first comes in, we look really carefully. We look under the microscope. We look with ultraviolet light, for example. We take the time to figure out what the painting has been through, how it's constructed. We do a lot of solvent testing as well. So for example, if I need to remove a varnish, I need to carry out small solvent tests to make sure that I'm not affecting any of the original materials. So it's a lot of education, yeah. uh, a lot of chemistry, a lot of fine arts, uh, because you want to have uh, the right hand skills, and also understanding of art history. So this is an oil painting on canvas that I recently restored. It had a lot of damages, which hopefully you now can't see, and you can appreciate the work of art. When we work on paintings, on an oil paint, we wouldn't use the same materials as the artist used originally. So I would never use oil paint to retouch on an oil painting. If I did that, my paint that I would add would age very differently. It would darken and it would become very visible. It would change in different ways. So you would be able to see my retouching very shortly afterwards, even even if I match it really well from the beginning. So a big concept in conservation is reversibility. So today, for example, we use a variety of medium, including dry pigments in a stable synthetic resin medium. So what we use is non-discoloring. It can be easily removed, you know, 50 years down the line, 100 years down the line. Each painting is different. We work on both structural and cosmetic. So first I would make sure that the painting is structurally stable. These kind of traditional paintings often have varnishes. They discolor over time uh, with exposure to light. This painting was cleaned, so I removed the discolored varnish to bring it back closer to how the palette originally looked like. I mean, you see much more kind of vibrant colors, these beautiful blues and pinks. Losses happen over time. There is abrasion, um, loss in the paint layer, loss in the ground layer. Those get filled with stable materials. We texture it to match the original texture of the paint layer. We never fill over original. So we are only working in areas of loss, mimicking old paint with new paint which is very difficult to do. We match all of our colors by eye. It's a lot of layering, trying to make what is essentially new paint look old. We use really tiny brushes, sometimes working under magnification, basically trying to recreate the artist's techniques, often consulting with curators and keeping as close to the artist's intent as possible. If a large piece is missing, is there a limit where you like won't replace it, won't fill that back in? If a large part of a composition 
uh, is missing. It becomes a reconstruction. There's always a time and a place for something like that. We're always consulting uh, with art historians, with specialists in the field. Um, it's very much a conversation. You know, how far should we take in painting? What should the surface of the painting look like? Yeah. You know, what kind of gloss level should it have? A lot of it comes with time, you kind of develop a sensitivity to it, so you're familiar with how a 17th century painting should look like. Now with my brushes and understanding of the paints used before oil, in the next video, I'll be making my own paints using a variety of natural sources and chemically produced ones. And then, putting them to the test with my own painting.